like to call to order this work study for Wayfair Lake Area Schools. Uh, would the clerk please call the roll? Malloy? Here. Chapman? Here. Ellison? Here. Fahey here. Mullen? Here. Newmaster? Here. And Wilson? Here. All right. We'll move into our first discussion on sustainability update. Great. Ms. Paul. Thank you. Well, welcome everybody. I'm excited to be here with a team of folks to um, talk with you about some of the work that's been happening in the district under the broad umbrella of sustainability. Um, we want to just start by um, helping you to kind of look, have a few look for us as you're listening to the presentation. Um, as we look at our strategic plan, there are some of our beliefs that are really going to come alive as you listen to all of the various um, topics that fall under this broad area of sustainability. First of all, we are stewards of the earth. Um, learning enriches one's quality of life. Challenge leads to innovation and growth. And communities have shared goals. Communities with shared goals have unlimited potentials. Uh, potential. So we're excited to share about operational excellence and innovative programming, and um, get excited about some of the great things that are happening in our schools. And I'm here to share some of the things behind the scenes we've done operationally on this subject. Uh, Back in 2014 when I came to the district, it didn't seem like we had a really good direction of how we wanted to deal with our trash and recycling. Um, I knew some folks from the counties that could help us, so we partnered with Washington County and Ramsey County Department of Health, and then they did assessments of all our buildings. And as we walked, our, walked the buildings, uh, these uh, professionals started pointing things out to me. They said, Dan, we don't want a garbage can in one corner of a trash room and a recycling can in the other. We need, to, we need to pair them up, things like that, simple things. We need to label things. And they said, damn, we can help with that. We've got grant programs that can buy in containers, buy in labels. They looked at our cafeterias and they, and they said, our sort tables, we had some old wooden sort tables. They said, best practices, Dan. Best practices though, is the word that was common with these mm -hmm. folks. Best practices, Dan, we want stainless steel tables in our cafeterias, things that are easy to clean things with a rack that'll show kids what goes in which container underneath these these tables and once again Dan we've got grant programs that can help you buy these things and the counties ended up buying these tables for us buying these containers for us they looked at all the fluff we were using disposable trays in our, all of our cafeterias back in 2014 and it was just turning our garbage dumpsters in the big fluffy containers that we had to pay haulers to come get every day because of all the fluff in the containers. So Dan, we've got grant programs that can pay for reusable trays that you can wash. And if you've got dishwashers that weren't don't work, we've got a grant program that can buy you new dishwashers. We took advantage of all that and the county paid for everything to get us into a program that's sustainable and that we could lay out at all our buildings. And during that same time, we started hearing from students over at South Campus is, Dan, why are we uh, you doing food to, ho food to hogs at our elementaries and then we get to sixth grade, seventh grade high school and we're not doing food to hogs. We, look, we learned this before. Students demanded, we want to do this. And everybody thought, ah, when you get to that age, students don't care, they won't participate. We found quite the opposite. The students really <coughs> took control of the program and they made it work. They made it sustainable. We've got students in our elementaries. We've got their police in their recycling cans in their classrooms. They're bringing it out so the custodians don't have to in the large containers out in the hallways. So it's not the custodian's duty to do all this recycling. They've got enough to do. It's a whole partnership in our buildings now. And it's, it's a pretty cool thing. Um, I still talk to the folks that helped us at, at the counties and uh, we're the program that they, they want other schools to model after. We're not a model pro program, we're the model program when you talk to these folks. I get calls from districts all around the state that heard about our recycling program and they want to know how we did it. And the, the simple answer is it's a partnership with students, staff, principals. It, it's something that everybody's involved with and that's the only reason it works. And then just I wanted to bring up the food donation program. I talked to Bridget again this morning. She's able to, uh, she started a new program this year with leftover food that doesn't leave the kitchen. Normally in years past, all that would go in the pig buckets and out to the pig farm. 
now she's been able to give it to some nonprofits in the area. And so far this year, she's already given 1,100 pounds of food to nonprofits mm -hmm. that would have normally went in the big buckets. Uh, some LED lighting, I'm sure some of you have noticed. Some of our parking lots, <coughs> some of our gyms. We're, we're trying to go after the high use, high maintenance areas with LED lighting projects. Things like our secondary gyms where the lights usually go on in them gyms at 6 a.m. in the morning and they usually stay on until 10 at night. So those are the projects where we get a big bang for our buck in uh, lower electrical costs. And we've also taken advantage of some great rebate programs by XL Energy. The programs, so far every program we've done, we've gotten rebates between 30 and 50% to pay for that program. I know Onika has uh, where if there's no movement, the lights go out. Is that something that we're going to be, is it cost effective? And is it, if it is, is it something that we're going to be using throughout the buildings as we Definitely it's cost everything? effective. Yep, yep. We've, we've got quite a few of our buildings that are already set up that way. We, we'd like to do more. We're, we're really looking at quick payback things. So items, usually things that we can get done in two, two, between two and three years or under. They're kind of no-brainers mm -hmm. that it's worth us spending the money because we're going to save that money in energy costs within three years. So that's kind of our focus right now. And everybody knows about solar panels. We've been talking at it, the school board meetings the last six months. We are, we should be going live in October on at least, I would, I would guess five of the six locations we should be going live which is a pretty exciting thing. Um, <clears throat> we're planning on doing a handoff meeting with Ideal Energies, the solar installer who, who, uh, who also installed at many other school districts. And at that meeting, I, I'm hoping to get Sarah involved, Tim Wald, and we're gonna look at learning opportunities for students that we've got these panels on our roof. Let's get students learning about different projects they can do with, the, with these solar panels, different data we can collect off these panels. So, and Sarah is also going to talk about a partnership. Yeah, um, we, we do have a teacher at South Campus that is already engaged and very excited to see the data. He thinks it's going to fit nicely into an existing unit. And then Century College um, has started um, several different um, programs that are focused on solar energy. And so they're thinking that there are going to be some ways that once we have the data, we can sit down with Century around some of the program that aligns with, um, they've got 16 credit opportunities for certificates and assessor or installers and then they have um, 30 credit opportunities for a little bit more advanced systems management and then 60 credit for an energy tech specialist and so we're going to be connecting with them once we see the data to see if there's a way that the data can actually <coughs> qualify for some of the things that are offering the century program so to be continued you may see that show up at our uh, course proposals uh, later on this fall can I go ahead, Dr. Uh, I have another quick one. Yeah. And is that one of our buildings? That mm -hmm. is yes. That is Birch Lake. Okay. Yep. Cool. And then I have a quick one. I mentioned to Dan before the meeting I was at Willow Elementary today and looked at the array of meters on the side of the building and it was clicking away today like crazy. And it was interesting driving over I listened to Greta Thunberg who is 16 and her comments to the United Nations and um, I'm thrilled because we as an education facility I've, I've always felt that we should be leaders and a role model in the the community for this so it is really um, exciting for me to hear the report on all the things we're doing and I was at a graduation party this summer and had mentioned to previous students mm -hmm. that we were putting solar plant panels on and they talked about some of this and they were absolutely thrilled and said it's about time yeah so. yeah we were sarah and i were in a meeting with city, city leaders a couple mm -hmm. of weeks ago and business leaders and they were also very thrilled mm -hmm. we were doing this they, they said exactly what you said you're paving the way for us now to take it and apply it to our organizations mm -hmm. um, it was a cool thing Ms. Boyd. Remind me what percentage of our energy is going to come from these once it's all up and running? At the max, like our smaller elementaries, it'll be about 18% of that school's energy will be coming off of solar. And uh, some of our bigger schools, it's lower. I think it's nine at the least. So. 
And then the last item I want to talk about is water conservation efforts. Operationally, back in 2014, we all know White Bear Lake was way down. It was a big subject in the community. So we really started keeping an eye on what we were using, trying not to waste. I started, uh, B3 Benchmarking has got a great benchmarking site where we can track our data. I plug it in every time we get a, a water bill and we're able to kind of see spikes and it, it really helps me identify quarterly if we got an issue at a building. Right now we're so dialed in since 2014 that I know if there's an issue, if something spikes up, we get a hold of the head engineer right away. They usually have it figured out within a day or two of what's going on. So we're really dialed in using that benchmarking site. Back in 2014, we were billed for 200 million gallons throughout the district of water. And now in 17 and 18, we've got that down to 17.5 million. So 5 million gallons of water saved over the last two years just by us keeping a better eye on things. We also automated our irrigation system so we can monitor it from the grounds, from the grounds garage, what our irrigation systems are doing. So if there's rain in the forecast the next day and we were gonna water today, we can go on the computer and wipe all that programming out for the next day because we know rain's coming instead of having like we had to do in the past, go from school to school, controller to controller and setting things. So that's been a big help. Um, we also piloted a new water technology. We're working with a company that uh, has a new device they can put in your flush valves on all your toilets and it cuts the water usage by increasing the pressure that it's pushing through the toilet so you can use half the water and double the pressure and still get a, the same flush. We piloted it at uh, Willow back in 2018 and we saved 40% on our water bills since then. So we expanded that over to Lincoln and Central and uh, Lincoln already we're seeing a 35% reduction. So that's something we're going to look at too in the future. And now I want to talk about another water project we did with Ben and uh, Libby and Kelly, the water warriors over at Matoska. It was kind of a fun project where there was operational benefits, but we could also use it as an educational tool for our students. Okay. Yes. So every couple of years, I gather a group of students together, and we become their water warriors. Oh, I want to click on that link. Oh, yeah, it's okay. Okay, that's okay. And um, my hope as an educator is to develop a generation of kids that care about our water use. And we have generations of kids, a lot of you know Sophie Davis, she spoke here. Mm -hmm. And we have another, we have a group of kids that are coming up that care about water and take their learning and apply it to their lives and how they can share it. And these are two of the water warriors of ours. Yes, okay. In the past few years, we have had several water-related opportunities and experiences. We've organized a school dance that raised money for H2O for Life. We have participated in and planned multiple water walks at our school, and we put together a few all-school assemblies. Other projects we have done within our elementary school include completing a water audit and visiting classrooms to teach students about water around the world. Throughout and following these experiences, we've learned many life skills, some being collaboration, communication, teamwork, how to set and reach goals, and how to teach and be a role model. Of course, we learned about the water crisis, how it affects people around the world and people in our community. We've also learned many ways to be aware of our water usage and how to conserve water. Finally, we've learned to be super incredibly grateful for all the water privileges we have. We hope to continue helping people all around the world and in our community. We plan on doing more water audits and continuing to teach adults and students about the water crisis. We are also hoping to incorporate the water crisis into White Bear Lake Schools curriculum. In conclusion, our main goal is to create a larger water awareness community and we appreciate your help in growing this community. Thank you. Do you have any questions for Kelly? Questions Olivia? regarding Ms. Ellison? I just want to say that I want to echo what Ms. Fahey said. I listened to Greta Thunberg speak today and you are doing that work here in White Bear Lake and we are so grateful that you are leading the way for us. So, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. 
Ms. Fahey. And girls, I know you're now in middle school. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes. so one's at Sunrise, one's at Central. Yes. yes. How long have you been doing this? Did you start in elementary? <clears throat> yes, we even? started in fifth grade. In fifth yeah. grade. We were water wars in fifth grade, but throughout our whole elementary school, where the, the fifth graders above us were water wars, we were involved in the activities they were planning as well. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yes. yes. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Beloit. Are you guys doing this at Central and Sunrise now? We aren't right now. Um, we don't have, we don't really do any water wear type things, but we, we, hope, we yeah. hope that we can incorporate it there too. Yes, mm -hmm. that'll be fine. Perfect. Any other questions? Oh, comments? I'm sorry. I just thought of something. Um, this is super last minute, but I got an email from the MSBA, mm -hmm. the Minnesota School Board Association. They are looking for mm -hmm. session proposals for their conference. Mm -hmm. And it's due today. Um, so it's super last minute, but I think with the, the leadership that, Dan, that you've been showing as part of the district and with the Water Warriors, mm -hmm. it might be a really great thing to present at the MSBA conference mm -hmm. to show everybody else, you know, in, the dis in all the districts what can be done. Mm -hmm. What can be done student-led and what can be done district-led? Well, let's have a little conversation after this. How about yeah, that? Okay. okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you for that. Okay. All right. Um, well, this is a good segue because um, uh, Mr. Butters, Ben Butters, has been involved in some work that we've been doing. Um, first of all, we got a legislative grant over the last couple of years for standards-based instruction, um, and then we've been partnering with the organization H2O for Life. And so, that has been embedded into classes in terms of learning about water. In addition to that, um, Ben is a teacher that has just really gone above and beyond and really um, create those opportunities for these students to make a local and global impact. Well, we again got legislative funding this year. And so with that, we convened the group of people that have been working on um, the partnership with H2O for Life over the last four years. And we had students, educators, a lot of nonprofit organizations, um, we came together and we said, what have we learned in this work so far? Um, because our, we've really elevated um, the way that we are doing um, uh, our science standards through this partnership in the classrooms. And what you see in the middle there is what our group is in the process of really putting together all of the ways that um, students can actually lead change in communities, both locally and globally. And so each of the little tiles there represents um, an area that if you click on it, it shows an expanded way that over the four years we've learned that students can actually connect with local organizations. Um, and so then the next step is that um, we are going to be convening, White Bears, the anchor, is going to be convening students from across the state in a student summit. And it's all funded through this legislative grant. MDE right now is going to be putting a request for proposals out for other school districts across the state. And they're going to be able to come and take advantage of the work that we've been doing here in White Bear so that they can expand the impact in their communities. Um, and so these, um, these students will have an opportunity to share not only um, the excitement around what they did, but then also share with other students how they were able to actually put it all together. And so it's a great opportunity for our students and it's a great opportunity for our state because it's um, obviously a... Um, a much broader issue beyond our borders, but I think we, as Dan shared earlier, had an opportunity as a broader community to really rally around the symbol of our community of the White Bear Lake, and it's made a big difference. And so you'll be hearing more about that down the road, but um, we're excited to see that whole piece coming together. And so the student summits are gonna happen in January and March, and then there'll be an opportunity for them to present at an innovation conference in June. Expanding our learning. Um, <coughs> all right, the next piece that we wanted to talk about has to do with um, some opportunities around energy efficiency. Um, we uh, have taken a really good look at our manufacturing pathway. We have had um, students annually, they're in focus groups, and they meet with uh, representatives from the Greater Twin Cities United Way as part of a grant we got a few years ago. And one of the things that the students really were wanting was more alignment with opportunities to earn college credit. Obviously, we are a leader in that area where we have over 50 um, college credit courses now available to students. And this was the one pathway that there were not any of those opportunities. And so we spent quite a bit of time with the instructors over the summer and meeting with different um, partners. 
and Train actually emerged as um, an industry partner that really wanted to be part of the solution. And so um, they are going to be um, partnering with us to offer a dual enrollment course through Century College. Um, and what they really do there um, is really leveraging their smart technology that they have in their control panels and giving students a chance to really apply what they're learning in class and see what it looks like in the in real world um, because the train has a huge training center right here in our backyard and those students are going to be able to um, go right away. it's coming up in a week here on October 5th to go over and experience kind of what it's like across seeing the broad organization in terms of all of the ways that they're using new technologies to kind of bring about more um, efficient uses of energy. And then train will also have people come into the classroom. So that's an exciting way that that work has advanced in a short amount of time. Do you have any questions about this? Any questions, comments? Okay, thank you. All right, in addition to that, um, Dan and I are both part of um, the city's committee um, that is um, smart, um, Smart municipalities, and as you look here, uh, the climate smart municipalities. Uh, there's several cities ac across Minnesota that are partnered with cities in Germany, and the cities in Germany are um, farther ahead than us um, in terms of the, the col uh, collective impact approach that they've taken to really look at um, sustainability. And so, right now, the city of Whiteberry has a team in Germany um, visiting the city. And in advance of that, one of our teachers, Mr. Salinger, um, I was seeing if he's here, he was going to try it. He has a graduate school class tonight, but he's going to try to pop in. Um, his class will be partnering with the students um, in Germany, and they're going to be comparing data that are, is collected in order to um, look at opportunities available for being more efficient with, with our resources. So we're very excited that the City of White Bear um, included us in that work and excited that we have a teacher super excited to be engaged in that. Any questions on that? Okay. And then um, we're really excited about opportunities to prepare students for the future. Our incoming kindergartners are going to be our graduates of the year 2033 and we've got to be thinking about what we're doing in our programs because 65% of the jobs when they graduate don't exist yet. So we've always got to be thinking about how we're going to really be preparing students for the future. What year do you guys, what are, year are you going to graduate? 2025. 2025, okay. <laughs> so we are thinking about you all the time and thinking about how we're going to create opportunities for you. Um, we're doing a lot right now. We are in the fourth industrial revolution. So when we talk about smart technologies and automation, that is the here and now. And so um, a lot of what we're doing is taking advantage and seeking how we can bring those opportunities forward for our students. Um, because we aren't sure what the future is going to look like yet as people talk about this shift to the fifth industrial revolution. Um, so to do that, we really look for opportunities for collective impact, to apply what we are talking about in school with the four C's and making sure that we are working with our community partners to make this kind of learning um, happen for our students. And so right now, we um, are part of a really exciting project. Um, about six months ago, we started um, meeting and this collaborative group has grown um, but there is an opportunity um, there was an opportunity for us to partner with the University of Minnesota Humphrey Institute on a research study study and the research study was about what does a community need to do to be ready to have a demonstration pilot for self-driving vehicles and we were part of that study a lot of that had to do with Tom Snell Chamber of Commerce who's really excited to innovate and bring new technologies into the city um, and to be part of our work of how these technologies can impact um, and make a difference. And so we were part of that study and then what we realized is that White Bear emerged as the leading city to actually put together a proposal. And so we put a proposal together in which White Bear would run about a mile and a half route of a driverless vehicle. There would be a person in the vehicle um, to make sure that you know people felt comfortable and safe um, and there would be a way to, to override if anything were to happen but it is um, the highest level of autonomous vehicle that would be here on the pilot um, and the exciting part for us is that we've from the beginning been thinking about how can this align to learning and how we can approach this learning in partnership with Century College University of Minnesota to really think about um, what training would look like because um, most of the research out there, or articles out there say that within the next three to five years, there will be 
people needed in the occupation and the transportation sector is going to shift in order to want um, people that are prepared for this workforce need. And so we are right now one of two cities that are in the second stage of a proposal to um, Minnesota Department of Transportation. And the other really exciting aspect to our program, which is very unique, um, in addition to workforce needs and the education alignment, is that we are really um, focusing our route around meeting the needs of people with disabilities. Um, that's a big gap for um, people with disabilities in our community right now miss out on a lot of opportunities because of lack of transportation available to them. And so a lot of our plan really emphasizes including them in opportunities for um, messaging out to the community around how this could be something that could really address some of the needs that they have and then also being part of the demonstration pilot um, on the vehicles. So we are excited to see how this advances and um, there was, were two community listening sessions last week um, and the proposal will go in in the middle of next month. So do you have any questions on this? Questions, comments? Okay, right. thank you. And then, um, whoops, I forgot to share that with you, but I tried to do that. So that, that wraps up this presentation. Um, do you have any general, any questions in general for the group? Okay. Um, do you guys have any ideas that you're willing to share? Feel free to talk to me after. I'm part of Environmental Club at South Campus, and we're looking for, we weren't coming up with our minds, we're looking for other things to implement. So if you guys have done any cool stuff at the elementary school, feel free to let me know. Okay, for sure. Thank you. Thank you all for your leadership. We really appreciate it. Appreciate you giving us the opportunity to hear what's going on and giving us an update. So, thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, with that, we will move on to our next discussion item, B2, 2018-2019 World's Best Workforce Summary. Ms. Paul, is that you too? Yes, yes. Well, again, I'm glad to be here with a team of folks to um, give you an update on last year's um, summary of the 2018-19 World's Best Workforce and Achievement Integration um, work that was happening in the district. Um, Brian Morris is really going to be the key leader of the presentation. But before we started, we wanted to make sure you had the opportunity to connect a couple of faces again with some of our liaisons that really do incredible work um, and wanted to give them a chance to provide an update. Um, Nirvana is with us. He just had to run one quick errand, but you know, we're just gonna kind of go with the flow and um, we'll start with Jordan and Brianna and they can share a little bit of an update with you. Great, Buju, thank you all for having me here again. Um, it's good to be back. Uh, I was asked today to provide three bullet points that captured some of my work from last year and putting together those three bullet points was very difficult for me. <laughs> so I am going to wrap this up the best I can in three points. So in 2018-2019, I continued to facilitate student groups that provide platforms for student-led social justice initiatives, which we talked about before. Um, these student groups include Just Us, Black Girl Magic, and Indian Education Clubs, uh, both at our middle schools and our high schools and some elementary schools. Through our work, students from each group were invited and participated to be a part of the district's equity planning committee, equity planning committee, where we created the equity commitment statement and the equity decision making protocol, which was a big win for us. In 2018-2019, I also presented at three different conferences, both, both in-state and out-of-state, where I shared the district's strategic plan with an added focus on student agency and student voice. Presentations covered the district's work around utilizing student voice at the building level, the district level, and community leadership levels. The conversation around community leadership levels included the initiative of over 20 diverse youth attending the Urban Leadership Academy alongside district representatives. My last bullet point is further, I began restructuring the Indian education programming at the secondary level. Initial programming was centered around 
book clubs. We had an influx in um, indigenous author literature that we have for K through 12 purposes, but this did not meet, meet the needs of our secondary students. Re so therefore, we restructured to focus on culturally relevant post-secondary information and culturally relevant independent study work. We had al always been doing the post-secondary information, but we added that focus of the independent study work that was culturally relevant. An example of that is in 2018-2019, White Bear Lake had the first student ever, ever in the history of the district to receive credit for an indigenous language through an online outlet. Conversations will continue with the teaching and learning department for 2019 and 2020 uh, school year in collaboration with the American Indian Parent Advisory Committee to explore culturally relevant independent study work. So that's what I have for you today. Thank you again for your time. Yeah. Should we just go on? Okay. Um, so, hello. Thank you for having us once again. Nice to see you all. Um, I so last year, um, one of the things that I did was it was hard. It was hard to come up with like three bullet points. So I think both of ours probably ramble a little bit because we tried to mush a lot of things. <laughs> um, three little sections. So I did last year um, seven year-round Latinos Unidos mentorship groups. So I have one. Last year I had one at Matoska. Um, two at Central, two at Sunrise, one at North and one at South. Um, the groups focus on historical context, identity, including Latino self-concept as scholars, mentorship, leadership, and unity. All, obviously all age appropriate, meaning that the curriculum I use for high schoolers is not the curriculum that I would use for Matoska. Um, did a lot of work with Strategy 7 Monitoring Oversight with Tim Maurer. Um, that's engaging families as partners in the education of their children. Um, that's included uh, copious amounts of family engagement, um, collaboration with school staff, um, and a lot of what's very interesting to me, a review of systems and processes here in White Bear Lake that create opportunity gaps for families and therefore their students, and how um, sometimes it's just a real easy fix, and other times it's going to take a little bit more time and Attention. Um, and then the third thing um, that I put was across department collaboration. So with IT, I hosted multiple parent workshops around starting the school year prepared, um, uh, record an automatic attendance call in Spanish for each school for the first time. Um, Latino families were not getting, they were getting the calls in English, which meant nothing. And so they didn't always know that their student was they thought their student was at school when in fact they weren't. Um, so that's been really helpful for families and created a new process for the district's annual family update, um, which has had a significant impact on the number of Latino families um, completing their annual family update. Um, with community ed, I brought English language classes to White Bear Lake for the first time and collaborated on a number of Latino family community events, um, expanding Latino student opportunities and bridging the gap with their families. With communications, we did so many things. Um, I created a Spanish language web page for the White Bear Lake. If you go onto the main page, White Bear Lake's main web page, there's a box in the corner that says Español, and it actually has useful content now, which we worked really hard on. Um, and we, I have a translated commonly used documents list that's available for all White Bear Lake staff to use to communicate with their families and a translation interpretation resource page, resource page uh, for staff as well. Um, and with nutrition, I helped streamline the uh, free reduce, reduced lunch process with the lunch account balance um, by recording calls for each school that let families know um, when they have low to negative account balances. We had a large number of families last year that I was alerted to in like April that they were negative 500 and had had no idea, which to me indicated like a problem in the process, which which we resolved. Um, and by pushing to get the free reduced lunch app sent out in Spanish, Spanish, which happened for the first time this year. Hi, my name is Nirvana Yang. I'm the Hmong and Asian American Cultural Liaison for the White Bear Lake School District. Um, Last year I was the advisor for Culture Club, uh, where we celebrated and learned about different cultures each month. 
um, towards the end of the school year. We also got to, we took the kids to Festival Nation, where the students discover more about the world, embrace rich culture, diversity, brought to us by immigrants around the globe. And the students also helped out uh, at Normandy's Park first uh, culture night ever, which was a great turnout. Um, last year, I also administered the Hmong bilingual CO test, which was first available to Hmong students last year. And we have a student who took it, and she was able to get the, the golden seal, which earned her some college credits. Mm -hmm. And that from moving on forth, hopefully we can push for um, where students could take it online versus paper. Um, I know the, the education of, of the department, they're working on that. And celebrating the Hmong New Year last year, I went to Hugo Elementary to teach about Hmong, uh, the Hmong New Year while we celebrated. And just to teach uh, students at an early age to introduce them to different uh, cultures. So as growing up, they, they're aware of it. Um, also reach out to principals and on the in the morning in the morning announcement to wish them a, a, a happy Hmong New Year and students are very impressed and pleased by that as well. Thank you. All right, my name is Miles Webb. Um, this is my first year. I've been on the job for about a month. Um, so I, I was in St. Paul for ten years. Um, the last five uh, I spent as a as a behavior specialist, and five before that I was a special ed TA. And uh, some of the things that I want to do, like I said, I'm, I'm still in the process of planning and trying to put things together, but uh, one of the main things I want to do is help foster a sense of like a pride amongst our black students and show them parts of black culture that aren't necessarily the things that you might see or negative Im images that you might see on TV or other things like that. Another thing I want to do is help find out why the students of color get more referrals than our white students and try to find out, you know, how I can help lower that and I'm not trying to do it on like a school by school basis so I'm trying to show my face there you know as many schools as I can every every week at least once or twice. I spend three days a week at the um, at the north campus so you know that's, that's where the majority of time I spend but you know I try to get to you know Sunrise or, and you know Matoska you know as many places I can get and also um, I try to help the, um, the families as well so you know there are some some uh, some trouble families and you know and, and, and because the families can be troubled, sometimes it, it's the students bring that to the school with them. So, um, you know, trying, you know, like if there's housing issues or, you know, um, you know, problems with, you know, paying fees and things like that, then, you know, I try to, you know, point them to where the resources are for that. So those are just, you know, the things I have, you know, that I have had plans that I'm starting to put in process right now. So, thank you. Any questions, comments? Um, Welcome, Miles. Thank it's a great district. I hope it works very well for you. Thank you for all your work. I know that being in Willow today and around the, the district, the, the families really appreciate it in terms of recognizing every, every group that we have in the district. So thank you very much for your work. Mr. Chapman? Um, yeah, I also echo that. Thank you so much. Um, a lot of work that's has needed to be done and it sounds like is getting done now and a lot of time sure more to go. The question that I have is um, you had mentioned in terms of the various recordings like lunch accounts and so forth. Um, I assume that that's getting applied uh, in terms of the like the Hmong language and, and that we're not working in silos but I, I would assume that we are working collaboratively and collectively on the various languages, such as the lunch account issue and, and uh, the various resources. Um, can anybody speak to that? Just to, you know, uh, as Paul is. Yeah, so Brianna and I, we do a lot of um, translation um, on documents or, on, or we serve different communities. So the Hmong community, the language is fairly new. A lot of our parents don't, don't read or write Hmong. And so a lot of that, what Brianna transfer into it, in letters, we might have to do that different for my community, doing for robocalls and meeting one-on-one, -on -one, things like that as well. And I'm sure Brianna does that as well, um, we'll meet one-on-one, -on -one, but it's just the different communities and different communications of the, the needs that, are, uh, that our community needs. 
What do you mean the parents don't speak Hmong? Well, the, the thing is that, uh, so for example, if a letter is written out in, in English that needs to be translated in Hmong, in Hmong a lot of our, our, our parents that can't read or write in Hmong. They can speak Hmong, but they can't read and write. Oh, okay. So therefore, the, the different um, mm -hmm. way of communication is uh, either robocalls or meeting one-on-one -on -one to explain mm -hmm. what the document um, is saying. Yeah, I like, I like what I hear in terms of what's going on there. Um, I uh, just want to make sure, yeah, it's, we've got a uniform approach because so many times it seems like in the past we've had, like, for example, one elementary school doing something different, you know, where if we can uh, bridge the gap and have the same, you know, if the issue is the same from school to school, for example, that it's being dealt with um, uniformly. And, 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 it sounds and honestly, like I, don't, I don't think that they probably have talked to you about doing that, but... You and I can go talk to them <laughs> and just make sure that that happens. Right. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Boyle, Thank you. Dr. Newmaster. I was just going to say what everyone said, that what you're doing is critical, essential, exciting, and we really need you. You are so valued. And whether you're, you know, you've got a structure from last year or building a huge new structure this year, um, everything you do is the ones that we're missing and we all need to learn from you and as we were trying to work on like a community and strategic planning team that was one of the things we looked at how many different groups do we have in our community we're not reaching when we've got good programs so whatever insights you give us boy speak up and holler because <laughs> it's great what you're doing thank, thank you, you. Thank you. Yeah, I just, oh, I'm sorry, I just have a real brief question for Jordan. Yeah, what was the language, the indigenous language that the student learned? It was, she did it online through her tribe, actually, and I'm sure you all know the wonderful Miss Jennifer Adams, who mm -hmm. is stepping up as the school board liaison, we're really, ex or the student school board liaison. We're really excited about that, but she did it through her tribe, through Hocha. So that, she did it completely online and we worked it out with her school counselor. It was a total collaboration <coughs> between Jennifer's initiative, um, also the Indian Education Program, North Campus, the school counselor to send over like how many hours are we doing and transferring that into credits and things like that. So it was a really exciting process and I think that is really the importance of student voice is they can bring things to the table that it's like, mm -hmm oh my gosh, there are all these online platforms that that's a great idea. I mean, obviously the goal is to be able to offer Ojibwe, Dakota, whatever indigenous language in our schools, that, that, that is our end goal. But until that point, there are platforms that we can utilize that our students know about. So when you just allow them the opportunity to share their expertise, they will really knock it out of the park so she mm -hmm. did get her credit for that and there was a, a collaboration created too with her tribe in that process to how many others of our students are members of your tribe that we could share this opportunity with so that was just an opening point for i think how much we can expand our indian education program If Jennifer doesn't brag about this. <laughs> it's pretty humble. She had, we gave her opportunities to talk about herself. Definitely. She, her, she, we have she to give is her Miss Humble, herself. yes. <laughs> Definitely. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. I'll go ahead. All right. Um, well, thank you, board members, Chair Mullen and Dr. Kasmerchek, uh, for having me here today. Um, what, under Minnesota statute, uh, school boards are required to adopt a plan to address uh, the goals of the uh, world's best workforce, um, and as well, the, the world's best workforce and our achievement and integration summary are, are, are a single report. So um, you had the opportunity in the, in the packet to take a look at the, uh, the, the draft of the summary. Um, anybody that 
finds the one mistake in it that I found this afternoon. You win a quarter. <laughs> See if you can catch me, catch my math mistake. Um, but it's been fixed, and when it comes to the board uh, at the next board meeting, um, it'll be the, the final version. Um, like I said, uh, this is the, the world's best workforce made up of five uh, components that all children are ready to start kindergarten, um, that all third graders can read at grade level, that all achievement gaps between students are closed, and that all students are ready for career and or post-secondary education, and that all students graduate from high school. Um, and what I will do is um, just speak to each of those five a little bit, as well as sort of the, the supporting data and some of our work behind it. Uh, pause, see if you have any questions, and at the end, um, if there's anything you would like to go back and revisit, we can do that as well. Um, first, that all children are ready to start kindergarten. Um, we have two metrics that we looked at this year. Um, one is kindergarten screening, which is what we had used as a metric in the past. Um, and the second was uh, pre-K uh, five-day kindergarten. Um, our kindergarten screening numbers moved up this year um, from 625 students in 2017-18 uh, to 744 students screened in 18-19. Uh, um, our pre-K program stayed about the same the two years, um, 205 students in uh, 2018 to 199 students in 2019. Um, in the future, uh, I've spoke with uh, Kate Anderson and we're looking at uh, also including um, just some small measures of academic growth uh, moving forward based on an uh, assessment they use called the TS Gold. Um, they've really put effort uh, into outreach uh, to specific communities served by their Title I schools. Um, they've been working with parents encouraging to, re to register for five half days, sort of drawing that line between uh, the, in, when they're four, they're, they're ready for five half days, so that when they're five years old, they can be ready for the five full days of kindergartens, of kindergarten. Um, and as well, uh, staff have been visiting parents to help them complete all the specific uh, aspects of pre-K registration. Um, so those are some of the efforts that, uh, that they are, uh, we are completing to, to have all of our kids ready to start kindergarten. Um, any questions on that component? Of the world's best workforce before we move on to this boy. The kindergarten screening is mandated, correct? Correct. So that's so it's essentially a how many kids we serve, how many families we serve, and how many come to us. Metric. But they can come, they can be screened elsewhere outside the district, as was stated. So does it really tell us much if our numbers go up and down? No, I mean it's I mean the effort that we put in, I think you do see, uh, if we weren't putting in effort, we wouldn't see as many students coming to us for screening. But you're right, it is more, it has more to do with the population and how many people come to us. That's why we're moving towards the metrics of kids that we serve in pre-K and then also including the, the academic metrics as well. So what's the advantage of them coming to us as opposed to getting a screening somewhere else? Not saying that it isn't what I'm just trying mm -hmm. to start looking at the thinking. Well, I can think of a call. It's tremendously valuable if students have, um, have identified, being identified for additional supports or needs early on makes a big difference um, to set them up for success in kindergarten. So we, um, in addition to the screening, they can go and get some additional assessments if we see something that shows up. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's very advantageous to students and families when we screen because of the like way that we look for those. Child special ed services, for example, student mm -hmm. But I mean, wouldn't that be identified elsewhere as well? Yeah. Or is it just because they would be in our system at that point and we can move quicker because we've identified it within our own system? Well, and we have economies of scale that we're able to take advantage of a broader net of resources when we see a need. Um, and, and it's it's a it's a part of our values to make sure that we really look for providing those supports. So, um, and I think the additional efforts that Brian mentioned about really wanting to make sure that the opportunity for the earlier <coughs> screening um, is is able to be accessed by more families. And it's also really, I mean, this is their first touch point as a bear, right? Mm -hmm. um, we. I think it was, was either this year or the previous year was the first year that they, you get a, a t-shirt 
when you're screened mm -hmm. and it's really welcoming kids into the white bear community and letting them know that they're they're part of the deal here the questions before i move on dr new master i was just going to say i've been a member of the ecfe pga for the last mm -hmm. now this is my fourth year and they knock themselves out to greet people and the first pga meeting there wasn't even seating for everybody that came in so the word is getting out and they see this mm -hmm. seamless welcome if they have special needs and some of the kids do they know right away and there's it's it's just it's just a really active group and they advertise so well that they have a waiting list there's not room right now for everybody that wants to come to the program so i mean they do a good job and if kids have special needs you know they they added more programming so i'm impressed with what they do yeah my youngest went through ecfe so yes. yeah. all right the second world's best workforce uh component is that all third graders can read at grade level um, we, our metric for that is simply the, the reading MCA at the end of grade three. Um, and our uh, percent of students who are proficient, so at the meets or exceeds level, um, in grade three in 2019 was 62.6%. Um, and that was uh, down uh, two and a half percentage points from uh, the previous year at 65.1%. Um, we do, when you, when you take a look at sort of the cohort view, um, we do have increases this past year. Um, our, our third graders going from third to fourth, that cohort grew by about two and a half percentage points. Um, and the number of kids who were proficient and in the group from fourth to fifth um, went up almost eight percentage points, 7.8. Um, this year, the, um, our principals have been really key, and I've been personally very impressed with the work that they've been doing creating a literacy vision um, over the summer, a team of principals, instructional coaches, and curriculum leaders um, are collaborating with a goal to implement um, with Fidelity research-based teaching strategies and practices for structured and explicit literacy instruction um, and with a focus on phonemic awareness. So a lot of coordination between our elementary principals um, and instructional coaches and curriculum leaders. Um, additionally, um, we've used something, uh, the, the BAS, which is a sort of a conferring method between a teacher and student um, to identify a student's reading level, um, information about student fluency their, and their comprehension within and beyond a text. Um, that has been used at kindergarten and first grade in previous years, and we've moved that up to second grade, done training over the summer, um, with actually training this Thursday for teachers that weren't able to make it over the summer, um, as a tool to help teachers better know um, on a one-on-one -on -one basis where their students are at and they're reading um, and to, to point them towards ways to differentiate sort of individualize their instruction um, for their students um, questions about the third graders reading at grade level so uh, the el the sped up those numbers are all uh, included in the overall number correct correct this is all all students mm -hmm. yeah why third grade? Is that a mandated? It is. It is mandated. Um, I think, you know, that's. I, I don't they, want to use the. I know. <laughs> we're we're avoiding using the coin term of that's when students um, shift from learning to read mm -hmm. to um, reading to learn, and um, what we've tried to do is just really show visually that. Mm -hmm you're always reading to learn and you're always learning to read. Um, it's just the progression of, um, of how that kind of synergy comes together. It used to be said that that happens at that critical third grade reading level. But I think we still think it's tremendously valuable to look at third grade literacy because we know gaps widen when students don't have core literacy. Um, and so um, I think it, it tells us an important, it's an important marker. There are also, um, expectations from the state in terms of how are you ensuring that individual needs are being looked at um, so that the gap doesn't widen for them um, but but it is a it, it is a um, it, it 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 helps to have a more um, 
complex answer because when you just say reading to learn versus learning to read, it gives a false dichotomy about what actually happens in that grade. So. Do you know if they changed the test or was, I think if I'm remembering right, it was 2014 or 2015 where overall every single student or every single um, group went down? It was, Statewide, our school, yeah. did we? It was, yeah, this, the reading test changed. Now I don't remember if it was 2013 or 14, but it has been the same since then. And it became, yeah, the, the, across the state, proficiency levels or you know the proficiency level can be wherever the state sets it but with that new test um, everyone went down because it was a, a different test um, and it is yeah it has been the same since then there are new uh, English language arts and new math um, standards mm -hmm. coming in the next few years so we'll see another test change again when those I just find it interesting that they change a test. The kids haven't changed, and the teaching didn't change, but you changed the test, and they, everybody across the board went down throughout the state. And, and now they're gonna, It's know. essentially changing the, the benchmark, really. Mm -hmm. It was Wilson. the content and the format mm -hmm. that was the hard, I think a real hard reach to go from one way of testing to, I don't know if the third graders are testing online, like the older kids are, but that's a big reach. It's a different kind of test. So it's hard to compare before and after. Mr. Wilson. In my mind, my question's related to Ms. Beloyd's, but <clears throat> I'll just ask you if there's any particular strands that are especially problematic. Um, and are you satisfied with the test at when it falls within our testing period that the students have actually been allowed to study those aspects. Um, there's nothing represented on the test that is yet to come in the remainder of the year, that sort of thing. Right, well, as far as sort of the timing, we have a, a pretty big testing window from the beginning of March until the first week of May. And yeah, it, the, the more time your kids spend learning before they take a test, the more they'll be able to show what they know. Um, and we try to strike a balance. We don't necessarily, as a rule, we very rarely test it in March, so we sort of push it back into that last three to four weeks of the testing window so that we're, we are representing as much of the school year, or all, of, of all the learning that our kids have done um, up to that point in the school year. Um, so yeah, we do, we do put effort into that. And I mean, plenty of balance and not not cramming everything together so that it stresses kids out and, and all of that as yeah. well. But you, you want to I mean, you're satisfied capture. though that the test actually reflects what they have studied and learned to that point. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's, yeah. It, it, the, it, it reflects the, the state standards in English language arts. Um, it is fully aligned. Yeah, but even at the end of the test window, you still have a month plus of the school mm. year remaining. This yeah. is true. Yeah. Uh, my concern is, is that something that's presented in that close to the school year is reflected on the test, which hasn't been addressed yet in the classroom. I, I think you're highlighting that there are a lot of factors that mm. frustrate people about standardized tests. Um, you know, there are things that, um, the anxiety that some people oh, sure. get concerned about students, but we're trying to really hold a mirror back to ourselves to say, based on our common interim assessments and core instruction that we're delivering, can we do better? Um, are we making sure that our students really are um, being delivered the instruction that gives them the foundational literacy needs? And we use the, the MC as one indicator of that, um, but we, we, we had a lot of conversation around that, and, we, and while there are a lot of factors that an annual test presents some additional issues, we, we still think that our students should meet proficiency based on the instruction that we deliver. And so it's exciting to see multiple, like a principal as um, the core, key instructional leader with instructional coaches and the curriculum leaders all coming together to make sure that we all have an understanding about the science of reading, which is where that explicit um, instruction, instruction comes from, and really make a commitment to improving and doing better. Okay, Dr. McMaster. We're looking at the science of reading and the only variable I'm going to put in there that we removed 
this year was the entire elementary library media program, which is statistically proven to close achievement gaps and opportunity gaps, and there's multiple national studies that show that. And we're one of only two districts in the metro that's done this. So I hope we're looking at reinstating a gaping absence in something that's really important to reading and transliteracy and literacy and all sorts of variables that we're just not dealing with this year. So it's a first. We've never done this. Mr. Chapman? Can you speak at all to how uh, the 2018 numbers for the uh, various uh, ethnicity groups compared to the 2017? I mean, did we make any gains? Probably not. You know, overall we, we uh, saw a decline, but how did how did those groups uh, do compared to uh, in 2018 compared to 2017 overall? You know, we all, our, our gaps are persistent. Um, I, I don't have in the, the third grade gap uh, material in front of me. Yeah. Um, when we get a little bit later on into graduation rate and some of the participation in the college level courses, um, but I don't have the, the MCA in front of me right now, but it's not to say, or to give you the numbers, they are persisting. They are pieces that, that we address through some of our equity work, through our, for all kids um, our, in, that are below grade level, our intervention work, um, and we, you know, all of our work that we do, and, and when you look at the, the building strategic plans, all of the work that we do has that eye towards serving all of our students and bringing them up to a level of proficiency. Is there, could you give us some numbers at some point to send out to us? Definitely. I, I, I would like to see kind of a comparison. Isn't that on the MDE? It's on the MDE, MDE website, but I can okay. put together just a, a summary for yeah, you. Yeah, if you would. Put it out, that would be great. Yeah. 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 Ms. Boyd. How long have we had the interventions in place? We've had, you mean, in, in just sort of a reading, a, sort of what we call a tier three reading intervention program? Yeah. Um, in various forms, oh, I would bet you we're pushing 10 years. Um, I, I want to say six, seven years ago, it, we really worked on making it sort of uniform uh, across our elementary schools um, and, and having it you know, really focusing on sort of research-based interventions and formalizing our processes um, around intervention, but in, in one form or another, at least 10 years. So what are we missing? I mean, if, if this is so persistent, and we, we still don't seem to, I don't think anybody seems to have a handle on it, are we looking at the right things? Are we just, I mean, there's just such a persistence in the numbers that to me it feels like we're, nobody seems to be getting at the core of what's going on. Um, did you want to speak first? Well, I just wanted to say, I, I think it's a lot of what Ms. Paul said, that there's a lot of variables. Mm -hmm. And my wonder with the MCAs is, did the kid have breakfast in the morning? Um, is there trauma at home? Are they not good test takers? Are they like my boys who didn't want to take the test, so they did poorly on purpose? You know, I mean, I think that there's so many variables that I, I feel your frustration that, you know, I mean, my, my third grader gets intervention and it is hugely helpful for him. Um, but, you know, it, it, it's hard to account for all these other things. Well, but even, even when you take those variables into consideration, the same, the same groups keep getting the same numbers. It's, it, so the variables are just, the variables are what they are, but well, we no one seems to be making a dent in it. But from my experience teaching, you know, we are talking about a test that's given on one day. Mm -hmm. And looking at those groups, what I believe MD, you know, someone is doing at the moment is looking at bias in those questions. That was my question mm -hmm. too. It come, you know, I, at one stage I was talking to one of our cultural liaisons, and if you have a question, for an EL student or a special ed student, 
talking about the sport of polo, the child may very well have the skills, but does not know mm -hmm. what that means. Mm -hmm. right. So there is bias in the questions. It comes from a certain cultural background. Um, I know with the science MCA, with the Hmong students that took it, there, because their language is not a written language, there were terms that were used that would throw them. Mm -hmm. They had the skills to do well on that, but the test was not designed for a student that speaks Hmong at home and does not have a, a written language. So again, we're talking about lots of variables, but those groups are up against a brick wall sometimes before they even start. And I'm, I'm not making excuses, but I'm saying that's the reality. Uh, having been a teacher for 39 years and being judged on a test score that the kids do on one day, when they send you sample questions and you send back and say there are problems with these questions and nothing changes. And then I would just add that the thing we also do is we look at growth to proficiency. Mm -hmm. We have students that mm -hmm. work, it, te teachers are working with students that are making tremendous gains, but they don't get to proficiency because they were two to three mm -hmm. grade levels behind. And so that's not captured in a hard proficiency mm -hmm. score. Um, so that's another um, factor. And then moving away from third grade, looking at some of our MCA tests mm -hmm. in, in the upper grades, for example, the, um, the math and the reading test in high school, um, it's a big issue of students just saying, why, do, why does this test matter to me? Which is really exciting because now, um, as you look at um, students that, um, that would pass a certain benchmark and not have to take remedial courses when they, when they head to college, your MCA scores now count for that. Um, and so that's exciting so that there's actually purpose behind those exams and so then you can't Hmm. You can't have that accomplishment taken away from you or be asked to take multiple additional tests because the MCA now qualifies you to get right into a college level course. And so there are some slow changes, and, um, but I, I really appreciate your comments about bias on the test hmm. because it has been an issue and it has been a factor on other tests such as the AccuPlacer, which is why we've really worked to find other ways than AccuPlacer to measure whether a student is ready or not for, for college level courses. So. Exploring. So everyone has to do the world's best workforce. Would it be a better a better way to measure improvement or what we're actually achieving with these students to show what the percentage of growth is over year over year? So third grade to fifth grade. Mm -hmm. We have this percentage of growth in these particular groups. Would that be? And that's something that we, that, that's not something that the state Mm. measures well I shouldn't say that the state looks at um, how uh, performance band changes change right so the state looks at whether or not a student who was at does not meet last year did they move to partially meets or up to meets the following year so that's that's mm -hmm. the closest that uh, Minnesota comes to looking at, at growth and there are, there are some problems with that right that, those are big when you've only got four steps of growth right does not meet partially meet meets and exceeds um, those are big steps um, internally in, in, in some of the, the we do um, fall winter spring uh, growth assessments for us to look at and to see to monitor how our students are growing um, so the state doesn't do it, but that's something that we keep an eye on. And then just back to the, the intervention example, um, you know, when, when you are working with kids who, uh, like Ms. Paul said, are quite a bit below grade level, a student can have a lot of growth and still be quite a bit below grade level. Um, so what we look at is, you know, are we providing accelerated growth um, for kids that are in, um, in additional double dips in reading or double dips in math. Um, and, and that's sort of how we monitor this, like the, the, the growth of students in those programs. I just think as a board it would be, it would be helpful to know that number because that to me tells, tells me more about our effectiveness than sure. whether or not you're, because an English language learner, they're, they're gonna have huge growth as yep. they learn the language or 
someone who's had the interventions, it's going to have, if they're not having huge growth, then there's something else going on. Right. So it would be kind of helpful to see those, those numbers just to say, is that what we're doing? Dr. I think there's going to be an opportunity in the next few months and probably an ongoing mm -hmm. conversation for years about what do we define as achievement. Because um, this, this is, we're talking about eight tests you know, yeah. and there are so many other ways to measure achievement. And those conversations are beginning and I, I'm encouraged by those, the conversations that are happening because I think it's going to feed very well into this conversation as a board. You, you get it, you get the, you get what it is and what it isn't. And there's a lot more to discuss about defining what do we what do we want our kids to leave with. So I think, I think the stage has been set for that conversation. I don't know if Allison, you want to talk a little bit about where that where that emerged as part of our some of the work we're doing with uh, with the new strategy nine, which you ultimately still need to approve, but we've done some work on that. So I've pulled together a group of 30 people across our district to really think about as we look at becoming one high school, a new high school, not merging North and South campuses together, um, what are those big pillars that we want to kind of hang our hat on in terms of the student and teaching experience so that we could get out in front of and partner with architects so that the design accompanies that and it's not vice versa, which everyone is supportive of. And so for really a day and a half so far, we've come together and put together these really big things such as student agency, and the conversation Dr. Kazmierczak was referencing was around achievement and what that means for students and really the need to pair growth and achievement together and the group being really intentional, acknowledging that test scores are just one part of what that means for students. And um, Madison was part of that group as well. <laughs> so, and the student voice there was really integral in really thinking about that. So that's just a starting point. So groups will be able to dive into what does that mean? How do we actualize that? How do we, how do we define achievement? Um, and then there's opportunities to make sure we look at that K-12 or E-12 plus in terms of what does that look like for students graduating from our system, but what benchmarks along the way and experiences we want to make sure students have. So it's a very beginning conversation, so it's exciting for people to really think about what, what, what do we want might really to be in the future and how do we want to make sure our students achieve um, beyond you know, the test. And, um, and all the stuff you've mentioned here makes it a challenge to make sure how are we accurately measuring what our kids know and are able to do and then what does that mean for them because they're really pushing us to think about it broader. You know. Mr. Chapman, you had a question? Yeah, when you say uh, the group of 30, uh, is this uh, stakeholders uh, you know, across the board yeah. basically, students, community members, parents, as well as staff? And when we have representatives okay. from our system, not solely secondary teachers, we had elementary people there, parents, um, and it's really a beginning committee. There'll be many more opportunities for people to get involved. But really, from my own experience, knowing that we needed to be able to really intentionally answer questions around what does this high school look like, and I'm um, wanting to make sure it wasn't about us at White Lake and not um, something that you know we can. We used to have tons of research still to do, but giving people an opportunity to come together and, and really think about the student experience in the new building. Okay. All right, um, the third uh, component to the world's best workforce is that all achievement gaps between students are closed. Um, the, the metric uh, that we look at that for, for this uh, component is the, the equitable access and participation in college level coursework. Um, we have equitable enrollment strategies where we identify and provide uh, outreach and support um, for students who are uh, historically underrepresented in our um, in our college level courses. Um, we, we set a, a goal of participation based on the, the, the group um, that uh, has the highest partition, participation rate. Um, and this past year, our goal was raised to 64%. Um, when we began this work in 2015, um, our goal was 51%. So we've had really raised the bar as far as uh, participation rate and we've really sort of narrowed the gaps in participation. So we went from um, being 64 students away from equitable participation at the 51% rate in 2015, um, and now we're at the 64% participation rate in 11th and 12th grade, and we were 36 students shy of uh, equitable participation. 
Um, so, and we offer uh, 51 college level courses. Um, new last year was our, uh, our certified nursing assistant course. Um, this year, a big change is that we have advanced placement biology um, being taught at North for the first time, and we've got four sections of students enrolled in that. Um, and it's just, we, we've had, uh, well, I say, I say our, our goal was 64% and that we've narrowed gaps. And like I said, 36 students missing. We've had um, three groups who were traditionally underrepresented in these courses actually surpass our 64% goal. Um, uh, students who are Asian, students who are Hispanic, uh, and students who are two or more races um, from families who uh, are from medium or high income all surpassed that 64% goal. Um, so that's huge. And we've, like I said, we've got the narrowest uh, gaps that we've ever, that we've ever had. Um, one other, just sort of piece of that puzzle. Oh, Excuse I'm sorry. Me, Brian, I'm sorry. Dr. Newmaster had a question and Ms. Boy had a question, so. Yes. My question was, I'm thinking back to 2015 when this really started mm -hmm. and we were looking at targeting kids that we could encourage. Mm -hmm. And our biggest concern was where's the scaffolding? It's mm -hmm. not enough to have participation. How much, what's the percent of success and completion? Because we didn't mm -hmm. want to push kids into classes where they couldn't succeed. Mm -hmm. So there was a real look at that. Mm -hmm. But what's the stats, the data now on? They may have enrolled, but mm -hmm. how many kids that were at risk or underrepresented completed successfully? The, the, um, so two pieces that we look at, and I don't have my exact numbers, so I'm gonna give you the, the ballpark. Two pieces are uh, grades in the course and um, whether or not, uh, on the AP at least, whether or not they got a three or higher on the, on the test. Um, so for grades, we looked at uh, students that earned a C minus or better. Um, and and a, you know, a C minus in a college level course, I, I would want a student to have a higher than a C minus, but if you're getting a C minus in a course like that, if it's a you're course learning class something. like that, right. you survived. Right, and we have gaps, but they're small in percentage of, across race, ethnicity, and free and reduced lunch status. Um, around uh, percentage of students who earned a C minus or better. Um, and then, and again, I, I don't have the specifics for you, but I'm gonna say all of our gaps were less than 10%. Um, and then also as far as uh, taking the AP test, I think in a lot of ways, a lot of the AP courses have a slightly higher barrier to entry, so there aren't as, a lot of our, our kids who are taking a college level course for the first time, we've got some courses uh, in college and the schools, some of our concurrent enrollment courses mm -hmm. um, that our students who are taking college level courses for the first time, they don't have to have a lot of prerequisites for, um, and they're finding, so that they're captured in the grades. Um, you earn credit in those courses through grades. With AP test, um, as far as percentage of students getting threes, Again, there are gaps, but they are not, they're, they're not as big as some of the gaps that we're used to seeing when we talk about things like MCA. So I'm, while those gaps are not closed, you know, I was very pleased that we're moving in the right direction. And that's referring to back to how our students performed last year. Um, and, and, and we have put supports in place. We still need to put more supports in place, both for students that are taking these classes for the first time, um, for staff that are seeing sort of a, a new course or a change in, in sort of some of the skills that their kids are, are bringing to the class. Um, but I think, you know, looking at the grades, looking at the, um, the success rate with the AP test, I think we're really, we're really serving those kids well. Okay, well that was the big worry mm -hmm. as you're recruiting kids mm -hmm. that you not give and I look particularly at college and the schools because that's kind of representative of what a class would be like with the rigor it is a, for a semester a or a class. year. Yeah. And you want them to have a successful experience so that it encourages a second. And I, that's the kind of data that'd be interesting. You know, how many are repeating it? How many successfully and weren't discouraged from going on? Because right. we want them encouraged and supported. And we've had a real mm -hmm. bump up, and this is just speaking of kids overall, um, in the percentage of kids who've had at least one course by the end of 10th grade. 
Um, this last year it was 48%, um, which was up about 16 percentage points. So right there, if we're getting virtually half of our students to have a college level course before they finish 10th grade, they will take more, right? Mm -hmm. that there's, if, if you're taking your first college level course senior year, that's great, but you don't have room to take another one. You know, these again, are kids that looking, are going to have an opportunity Looking at the to data, is that the demographic that we were looking at in 2015 to encourage these kids who maybe didn't have college um, in the family to right. try it, succeed, and try it again? Yeah. And I know AVID supports that too, yeah. but uh, that's the kind of data breakdown that would be really interesting to look at because now we've got three years under the belt. Right. Mm -hmm. So how, how, how... So that three years under the belt, how have our supports changed and, and, and outcomes? And the individual demographic groups. Right. Because I think more kids are taking them. But are they the ones that in 2015 we were really looking to encourage and find? Well, and they are. Yes. I mean, as mm -hmm. we have more kids overall and all of, our, all of our groups are much closer to that bar of 64% now than they used to be to a lower 51% bar four or five years ago. Well, and at North Campus, we did a lot of work to make sure mm -hmm. when students were taking that risk, that it was a positive risk. Because right. I know if you're going to try to a class in 10th grade and if you're not successful, you, the chances of you continuing are very small. Yeah. And so it was, it, the past two years, it's been a huge effort of ours to make sure. Great. I, mean, I'm on a I saw it start, but I didn't see it continue, so I wondered. Well, and we worked really hard in our men's self campus together with FD Alliance and doing professional development to support our teachers so that they have feel like they can continue to learn and grow and how they support students who maybe haven't always traditionally been in those classes and that will continue this year but that was some really meaningful professional development that people and our teachers so when I think of making sure that kids are successful it's really many different efforts big sure. time was huge we used that time to support many different kids that are struggling or finding success but that was also another are taking um, a different type of risk in our honors in the college level classes that would be more to make sure that they're successful. Mm -hmm. Ms. Bloy. Her original question was exactly mine, so good. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Hold on, one more, Mr. Wilson. Oh, well. Good? Okay, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Um, the next uh, component of the world's best workforce is that all students are ready for career and or post-secondary education. Um, we measure this by looking at two things. One is the percentage of students that have to participate in remedial coursework uh, in college before they can take a college level course. Um, and then also our participation in uh, a career pathway. Um, it, this past year we had 29% of our 11th and 12th grade students participated in at least one career pathway course. Um, and among those students, um, we had 83 paid internships in 2019. So both that participation and the, really the, the, the business community seeing the value um, in those students has, has increased in the past year. Um, around our remedial coursework, uh, we, you always have to look back two years. So even though it's 2019, um, the, the remedial coursework that we're reporting on is um, 2017. So the class of 2017, after being out of high school for two years, 16% of those students um, had to enroll in remedial or developmental coursework during their first two years of college. Um, and that's, if you look um, long term, that's, it's, it's really decreased um, from 24% and again tracking it through world's best workforce. And in the years before that, it was almost as high as 30% of students would have to do that at least one course in their first two years. So the, our goal is to be down to 15% for the class of 2018. And right now, 16% of students in the class of 2017 had to participate in uh, remedial coursework. Um, and, and a lot of that has to do with the, the, the coursework that they're doing in high, uh, high school. Um, a, a lot of it has to do with some of the, the um, articulation courses that we have in place in reading and math. Um, and also, just recently, we're realizing the need to increase student awareness around their ability to bypass remedial coursework. Um, like Ms. Paul had said, they can now, it's state law that Minnesota State Colleges accept 
uh, scores on the MCA as a, as a way to, to bypass a remedial <coughs> math or reading course, um, as well as it's always been students could use an ACT, they could use a, uh, a course credit from a college in the schools class um, to show that they had already uh, achieved at a college level. Um, but just really helping them, th there's a gap between sometimes what they achieve and what they show the college that they've achieved. Um, and, I, and we're starting to do some work in that area that sort of a, sums, sums that up. So, so. Um, I know that World's Best Workforce is a state mandated program, um, but the thing that I've always thought is missing from this one is civic life. Because no matter if a student goes into a career or a college, they are all going to be involved in civic life some way. And so, Allison, when you were talking about kind of envisioning the future, and you know, Sarah, when you were talking earlier about the class of 2033, how can we be a leader in this district and focus on not just career and college, but also civic life? I think we're seeing a deficit right now in this country. And even though it's not required by the state, I think we have all the pieces here to start to focus on from our youngest kids, how can they be active participants in their community? We heard these two girls tonight, yeah. you know, we see Maddie and other students. I think we can do it. So just something to, that I really would like to think about as we move forward. The one thing I really like about our strategic plan is under multiple strategies, service learning and connections to civic involvement show up. And so I, I, I like that that's come out from a value of our community here in terms of what came out in our strategic plan. And so maybe there's a better way to capture all of that is happening that really is, is articulated as mm -hmm. civic pre um, preparedness. Yeah. Participation. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then the fifth uh, component is um, all students will graduate from high school. Um, and that's the, the class of 2018 four year graduation rate. There's always a one year lag um, in graduation rate. The 2019 graduation rate isn't official until um, this coming, usually comes out in February. Um, the class of 2018, 88% um, uh, graduated in four years, so that was 534 students. 8% um, or 48 students continued on um, at either uh, tech or at the ALC to work towards graduation. Um, and 4% um, of the students who would have scheduled to graduate in four years um, dropped out or uh, moved away from the school and to an unknown, uh, unknown school beyond, uh, beyond our district. Um, of the 48 students who continued to work towards graduation, 19 of them have graduated since then, um, and 18 continue to still work towards graduation at the ALC or the Tech. Um, so, so right there, you know, if we look at a five-year rate, that gets, up, gets us up to at least 92% of students. Um, they're sort of continuing on and finishing. Um, in graduation, uh, gaps persist. Um, but we have had an increased rate in the past year uh, for students who receive free and reduced lunch, um, a sharp increase uh, in, uh, by uh, graduation rate for Hispanic students. Um, their graduation rate was 76% the class of 2018. Um, our black African American students um, at about 82%, that sort of stayed uh, consistent from 2017 to 2018. Um, also in 2018, our ALC, um, a, a school where all kids there are considered at risk um, and behind in credits. They had a 10 point increase in their four year rate to 54% um, between 2017 and 2018. Any questions on graduation rate? Thank you. All right, one component of the world's best workforce um, that uh, sort of is not part of their five is the is that we need to ensure that uh, we're providing equitable access to excellent teachers for our students um, and the way that we look at that is the education level of our teachers uh, the, the, the experience years experience of our teachers um, and that the percentage of our teachers that teach within field 
um, so in the, the same field that they, they have their specific license. Um, we are, so what I pull together is both look at us as a district and then look at Willow Lane Elementary, which is our, our school with the, 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 our most diverse school. Um, and at the district and at Willow, um, we are uh, pretty far above the state in both percentage of students with master's degrees or more, um, and uh, the percentage of teachers who have 10 plus years of experience. Um, and then we're very, a little bit above, but very close to the state at the percentage of uh, teachers uh, teaching with, within their licensure field. Um, also, in the past year, we're really making headway um, to, towards providing students access to diverse teachers. Um, Matt had said we had uh, really streamlined and made our recruiting practices more competitive um, in the way that we've sought out um, teachers of, of color and teachers from diverse backgrounds. Um, and additionally, put professional development and support in place specifically for staff of color um, so that we're also addressing retention of staff that we've hired um, and hopefully resulting in a, a higher retention rate. Anything else that? No, I think that's really the significant push. Um, any questions on that? Mr. Chavin? Just a quick one. License and field, uh, that 2%. Uh, is there any particular area where we have folks that are uh, teaching where they're not licensed in that? I mean, or is this kind of just spread across the board? I mean, trying it's, to get at if there's any particular area that we, we have more of that going on than any other area. It's, 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 not, it's not in your general ed classroom okay. for the most. It's very specific areas from the, the very small handful of teachers. Is that, would you say that's Absolutely fair? Absolutely it is. It's in specialty areas and in some cases, um, you know, there's some, there's some courses that we offer where there's fewer than five graduates um, coming out in, in a given class in a year. And so, um, you know, there are, there are areas where we really do need to look at a more non-traditional route. What are some of those specialty areas? Um, some of those can include uh, facts, certainly. Then when you look at some of the specialty areas, within our um, IT offerings as well. That can be terrifically difficult um, as things have moved away in some cases from some of the traditional um, focuses that we've had in those areas. So those would be um, examples. ASL, for instance, would be another one. So American Sign Language, that would be another where there's hardly any um, graduates that are coming out with a license. Okay. Thank you. Um, and the last part is the, um, the uh, world's best workforce and the achievement and integration um, have, have been put together into one summary report. And I'll just go through our pretty briefly because many of them, most of them, refer back to world's best workforce goals. Um, we had four achievement and integration goals. Um, and, and these were goals that were set uh, at, our, at the beginning of our last achievement and integration cycle, which was, say, three years ago. If that sounds right. Because we have a new, new one in the works right now. So this is reporting back on our previous one. Um, our first goal was to increase our graduation rate to 96% by 2020. Um, and we've already talked about that as part of the world's best workforce. Um, uh, we had a, have a goal to close achievement gaps in reading and math by 15 percentage points. Um, and again, um, you know, we, we have achievement gaps that narrow and achievement gaps that persist or grow slightly and they, they, they move every year. And, and to, you know, to have that goal of moving towards a, a reduction, um, we're, see, we're seeing some success in, other, in some ways and, and not in others um, when you just base it on the MCA. Um, our third goal was to incre increase participation rate and rigorous coursework of traditionally underserved students who are college and career ready, which is also a, a world's best workforce goal. Um, and the fourth goal is specific to Willow Lane Elementary. Willow Lane Elementary 
is our one uh, racially identified uh, school within the district. And that we, the, the goal being that we achieve um, or increase reading proficiency at Willow Lane as measured by MCA to 70.8% by 2020. Um, reading proficiency at Willow has grown since 2017. Um, it was 50% and it has grown to 54.5% um, in 2019. Um, growth in third grade, growth in fourth grade, um, and a small decrease in proficiency level um, in fifth grade. Um, so those are the, the four goals of the Achievement Inter Integration uh, Program. Um, also part of the Achievement in Integration Report is uh, discussing um, how we have done uh, integration program in our district, and that's what uh, Ms. Mueller is here mm -hmm. to speak to. Hi, Cynthia Mueller, Principal at Otter Lake. Thanks for having me. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the partnership that we have with Willow Lane, Otter Lake and Willow Lane, um, and utilizing um, Tamarack Nature Center um, for that partnership. So as we know, Willow Lane um, is a racially isolated school within our district. They have about 35% um, students that are white, um, compared to Otter Lake, we're at about 79%. Um, and so this partnership started about, I think this is our sixth year, and what it entails is um, we work with Tamarack Nature Center, and um, we every classroom goes on three <coughs> different field trips over to Tamarack Nature Center that allows them to learn in the great outdoors, um, connected with the science standards. But prior to that, um, teachers, classroom teachers, are buddied up with another classroom teacher at Willow Lane, so Otter Lake and Willow Lane. Um, and they do activities really to get the kids to know each other, um, and they have a buddy. And then when they go over to Tamarack together, they're experiencing the lessons together, um, playing in Discovery Hollow together. Um, really the intent is that they create this buddy that they have and this common experience with three times a year. Um, so it's been highly successful. Of course, scheduling always becomes a little bit of a challenge. Um, we have the advantage Otter Lake, we can just walk over there. Um, and Willow Lane accesses the um, uh, achievement and integration funding to pay for busing over. So it's worked quite well. Questions, comments? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Any other questions going back over the world's best workforce that came up at all? Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you all very much for your time. With that, uh, are there any other questions or comments? Um, Ms. Boy? Do we have a schedule for meeting dates yet for world's best workforce? <coughs> um, I can get those. I'll send those to you tonight. Thank you. All right. With that, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Mr. Chair, I move to adjourn. I will second that. All in favor? Aye. Opposed?